Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I am Ruth Ellen Coker, Associate Dean for the Arts and Humanities in the College of Arts and Sciences for the last nine months and Professor of English at CU for the last 12 years. I am thrilled to see this chapel packed. Uh, I'm honored to have been asked to make these opening remarks for tonight's inaugural Lucille Berkeley Buchanan Lecture Series. And I want to begin by thanking you all for coming. I'd like to extend special thanks to my colleague Ann Carlos, Associate Dean for Social Sciences, who has been the engine um, that has led us to this moment. Anne can't be here tonight, but she emailed me this afternoon to make sure that Polly had all of her support. Where's Polly? So Anne emailed specifically, Dear Ruth Ellen, please give Polly my best emphatically wishes for the talk this evening. Tell her I wish I could be there. I don't have her email on my iPad. Um, it's raining in Dublin. Best Anne. As well, I would like to thank Polly McLean for her very important work, Patty Limerick, Kurt Guttar, everyone at the Center for the American West, Scott Sheeple, Stephanie Purnell and her team of advancement officers, Raylan Rabaka, Alphonse Keasley, Bob Boswell, James White and the Dean's leadership team, Celeste Montoya, Clint Talbot, and anyone and everyone else I may have forgotten at this moment, many people have come together for Lucille this year, as Anne has been quite busy gathering the troops together. Anne came to me not long after I began working in the Dean's office last summer and told me about the great work that one of our colleagues, Pauline Clean, has done on the first black woman to graduate from the University of Colorado way back in 1918. She explained that Lucille Berkeley Buchanan was not allowed to walk to receive her diploma at the time. Anne had that Anne look in her eye. That's 100 years ago next year, she said. She said, we should do something. We should do quite a few things. And so began the process of establishing both a scholarship in Lucille's name, as well as a series of events to recognize this grand feat of Lucille's graduation from CU, less than 50 years after the Civil War, two years before the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote, 37 years before the Montgomery bus boycott, and 47 years before the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law by President Johnson 11 days after I was born. The Lucille Berkeley Buchanan Lecture Series is the third in a series of events that we've collected under the theme of Remembering Lucille that will lead up to a ceremonial recognition of Lucille at this year's May commencement when Professor McLean will accept the diploma and recognition withheld from her a hundred years ago. The ceremony is going to be at once inadequate and yet monumental as we work together to make some reparation for the dim wittedness of our past leaders. I'll note here that if you're interested in hearing more about the Lucille Berkeley Buchanan Scholars Initiative, please contact Scott Schiefel. Scott, are you here somewhere? Up here, up here. There he is. Please contact Scott Schiefel, um, who is uh, currently the Interim Assistant Dean for Advancement, College of Arts and Sciences, Graduate School and Institutes. He's been working with us to make this scholarship initiative happen. As Interim Dean Jim White noted in his Colorado Arts and Sciences Magazine article titled Remembering Lucille, and our rectitude, uh, here at the University of Colorado, we hope to heed our better angels with this spring's recognition. Here to introduce Professor McLean is Patty Limerick, Professor of History and a faculty member in my own division. Patty Limerick is, as well, Faculty Director and Chair of the Board of the Center of the American West at CU. Professor Limerick has dedicated her career to bridging the gap between academics and the general public, and to demonstrating the benefits of applying perspective, historical perspective, 
to contemporary dilemmas and conflicts, which makes her the perfect candidate to introduce our speaker this evening. I also want to point out that in 2016, Professor Limerick became the official Colorado State uh, historian and was appointed to the National Endowment for the Humanities Advisory Board, the National Council on the Humanities. I'll turn the podium over to her now with many thanks for the work that she's done for the university, for Colorado, for our students, and for our citizens. Thank you. So, uh, we're building suspense here by <laughs> prolonging the introductions, and uh, I will then introduce three other people who will introduce each other, and then we'll introduce Polly. So that, I hope that's a plan that is satisfactory to all of you. Okay, good. And you know who you are. You, uh, I mean, let's go for five or six, really, be a little bit more inclusive with that. So, um, I also am thanking a bunch of people. Fortunately, Ruth Yvonne already covered some of those, so I won't repeat. Uh, those, but I would also like to thank the Senate of the American West team for orchestrating the event tonight. Kurt Gutjahr, Honey Lindbergh, Ronnie Iris, Austin Quiddy, and Nikolai Bowling. Uh, I'd like to thank, in anticipation, I'd like to thank my old friend Quintard Taylor, a history professor at the University of Washington and the author of an extremely important book on African Americans in the West in search of the racial frontier. And I am happy to say to a public audience for the first time that Professor Taylor has agreed to give the second Lucille Berkeley Buchanan Lecture in the spring of 2019. So, our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Polly McLean, teaches courses in media, culture, and globalization, media theory, communication, and international development, qualitative research methods, and uh, gender, race, class, and sexualities in popular culture and contemporary media. She really has range and you can put up a disciplinary boundary or disciplinary border and that just gets her stirred up and ready to cross that thing. So, so that is something I emulate and admire in my colleagues. She's also done important applied work uh, in partnership with the government of Swaziland. Swaziland, for instance, McLean was responsible for the first HIV AIDS radio campaign there and there are other such examples that I could, I could give here. She holds a BA from City University of New York, an MS from Columbia University, and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. The core activity of historians, and this is not what we usually say in public, but it's certainly the, the truth, historians lend their consciousness and vitality during their own brief time on the planet to the cause of bringing us back into the contemplation of the lives of the people who departed the earth before we could know them. In truth, it is accurate to say that Polly McLean has devoted a significant share of her own life to making sure that Lucille Berkeley Buchanan lives, lives on in our memory. This is a book and a presentation that both carry great potential and promise for the University of Colorado at Boulder, and I have quite a few thoughts myself about what that potential and promise could mean for the present and future of the university, but I will hold back on those thoughts for now, since Polly McLean has thought much more and much more imaginatively and, and much more deeply about the meanings of Lucille Berkeley Buchanan's life story for this campus than I have. This is a book about a teacher, and it is moreover a book that arose out of Polly's own teaching. That, I think, is a reminder we must always keep in our, in our thinking, a reminder never to go too far in separating the teaching mission of the university from the research mission. And, well, I should also say that for it, now, I, I would like to say that this biography, Remembering Lucille, is on every one of its pages a study in dignity, in respect, and in a refusal to submit to injustice. And because it is a book by Polly McLean, it also serves as evidence that a robust sense of humor is a far from an insignificant component of accomplishment. And before I have this very happy privilege of presenting Professor Polly McLean to you to speak on Remembering Lucille, I will take a moment of extreme self-indulgence and note that I have been very lucky in my friendships and becoming Polly McLean's friend will always register in my mind and soul as one of the high points of my good fortune. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Polly McLean. Thank you so much for those kind words. Um, 
and uh, took me by surprise that you would speak so long about me. I'm not as important, nor am I the center of the research and the work, but this woman is. Um, it gives me utmost pleasure to extend to all of you a great welcome on behalf of Mrs. Lucille Berkeley Buchanan Jones, who had a previous engagement and could not be with us today. <laughs> um, but I chose to bring her here because tonight we will walk in her shoes. <laughs> My conversations with you will cover some elements of her life and the research methods I chose to use, the legacy she left behind, and then I will follow up with Q&A. Oh, you can stop me at any time and ask a question. That's okay, too. Um, but with your indulgence, let me take uh, a slight departure. Lucille had a knack for making silent grand stands. Um, mostly to make a point, but often readily understood. Not too many people understood why she was doing what she was doing. Since none of her actions were publicized or advertised, let's walk in her shoes. In 1953, Lucille had retired from teaching in segregated public schools in the Deep South. And she went to the Deep South because after, she's a double first, I don't know if any of you know that. She not only is the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Colorado, she's the first African-American to graduate from UNC. Um, and most people are not aware of that. She did what would be her two-year degree today, is our two-year degree there, or take classes there, and eventually transfers to here, to major. So that's an important piece to acknowledge. Um, so, in uh, coming, she could not, when she graduated, they played with her so much so, um, even though the Denver Post had a large article with a picture of her, very interesting, saying she's the first colored to graduate from um, the state normal school at UNC and blah, blah, blah. It didn't register on them to give her a job. So she waited. Um, she graduated in 1905 and she was expecting. Um, she did great grades, I have a transcript. You know, pretty good, no C's, all B's and A's. Um, and therefore she took off and went down south to Jim Crow South, and began in Little Rock, Arkansas, eventually will go to Hot Springs, to St. Louis, Missouri, and then finally ended up a bulk of her teaching her career in the black metropolis, Chicago. And then she will return here. So when she came back here, about four years had passed, and one day she got up and said, I'm gonna go get me my tombstone. I'm going to buy me my where I want to be buried and under the conditions I want. Um, she bought it for a hundred bucks at Fairmont Cemetery. Um, she had her tombstone, which you will get to see in a moment, uh, made up with her name on it and the date she was born, leaving it open for when she would pass. Um, but something she knew that nobody else knew. And that is, her sister is where she wanted to be buried next to. And her sister, who had committed suicide, and somebody she adored and loved, was buried somehow or another in the white section of Fairmont Cemetery. And Lucille, and oh, they did have an ethnic section. Fairmont will deny they had a black, what is called ethnic, and if you go there, and I've gone there and tracked down everybody in that section, and the census tells me they're all black. So, she decided this day to do this in 1953. Well, what else was, I can understand, why did she wait four years? What else is going on in this period of time? 
And therefore, I went to look at the history, 1953. Did anyone tell me what was significant in 1953? Thurgood Marshall, right, was before the Supreme Court arguing Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka. Now remember, Lucille spent her whole life teaching in segregated schools. And what she did in a quiet way, non-publicized, was to go to that cemetery, show her face, and say, I want to bet the plot next to my sister. And therefore, they looked at her, they pulled up, and she, diseg she desegregated at that moment with her face. Now, when I come along many years later, quite a long time later, and said, can I see the card that you made up? Because everybody had a card back then. And the card said, her sister Laura was coated white. And when Lucille came on the scene, they decided to cross the white out and put C for colored. But she made a profound stand that day. And it would be even more difficult as I did this book to understand that she never got that wish. The state and the city of Denver um, and the public administrator who was assigned to her at 103 um, decided otherwise. And therefore she was buried in an unmarked grave at a family plot. And it was that article that came out in 1993 that I was handed and said, the first black woman to graduate from the University of Colorado is buried in an unmarked grave. And I went, what? And that set me on this journey of trying to understand why and what went on. Okay, uh, so uh, I often wondered, um, did she have some kind of you know, secret pleasure in doing what she did? Or was it this a small revenge against segregation she had fought all of her life? As she planned her end of life decision at Fairmont staff, in 1953, the same day that he is arguing Board of Education, <laughs> the same day he's arguing the case before the Supreme Court, okay? Um, and it was a secret, as I said, she only knew. And by the time I arrived in it, we found out a lot more. Forward to today, 2018. When this day was selected by the committee to launch, the Buchanan Annual Lectureship, named after Lucille, uh, on Blacks in the West, no one thought on this very day, at 6.05 p.m., the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Lucille was 84 years old. Also on this very day, in 1928, a young girl child was born in St. Louis, Missouri, who grew up to be an extraordinary writer, a civil rights activist, who for years did not celebrate her birthday. Today would have been Maya Angelou's 90th birthday. Two, activ two activists, one rooted in the black church, and one who changed our imagination with a pen, and who often said, it's a great blessing to have lived in the time Martin Luther King Jr., when forgiveness and generosity of spirit encompass, encouraged our citizenry to work for a better world for everybody. Each, connect, each concerned about the welfare, each of these were concerned about the welfare um, of those who history had left behind and had been marginalized or forgotten and wanted to correct the mistakes and injustices of the past. This year, uh, or this past year, has been challenging for the, for the nation and for the world. Decades of, progress, of progress in areas of social justice and equality have been threatened by careless actions and oppressive policies. 
For many, the faith in, uh, in, in the pursuit of happiness for all is being threatened by isolationism and driven and divisive measures. If we ever need to hear the voices of those who came before us, some of whose, whose lives were cut short by an assassin bullet for the freedom we enjoy and deserve, we need to hear those voices deep in our center of consciousness now and take action. I spent over a decade writing Lucille's story, traveling to states, 10 states, many times, multiple times, many cities in those 10 states. Um, and uh, I, I often thought, what would Lucille think about the challenges and nations of the world today, especially in the area of social justice and equality for all members of the human family? In taking a line from Star Trek, let me take you on a journey where no one has gone before. So come with me. It is April 4th, 1918, 61 days before commencement on June 5th in Mackey Auditorium, right across from where we are. Lucille was in and out of this building where we are today, at this moment. Uh, celebrating her life in a building, in this building which housed the College of Liberal Arts. And all of the college departments were here, including the Department of Germanic Languages um, and where she would attend classes. So she was in here with us. Uh, we're walking now in her shoes. Um, Lucille Berkeley Buchanan Jones never sought the spotlight or public recognition. Instead, she chose a life as hushed as falling autumn leaves. As I began to unravel who she was, I developed a passionate curiosity about Lucille and about her remarkable life that she led. Born in a barn to emancipated slaves near the South Platte River in Denver, Colorado on June 13, 1884, towards the end of the uh, of the period, uh, Lucille did not seek, as I said, public recognition. But as I began to unravel who she was, a passion curiosity came on me um, about the remarkable life she's lived. And in this period of time, she was born in what we would call the Victorian era and would die on November 13th, 1989, as the, dec as the decade of greed and the me generation was coming to a close. Through the 10 and a half decades, Lucille rejected with prejudice the traditional roles uh, relegated to black women. Instead, settling on a career path that would require courage in the face of pernicious Jim Crow laws. She was hired as a teacher in Hot Springs after being denied a job here, um, Arkansas. Taught at the Baptist College in, 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 um, in, in Hot Springs, and she also taught at one in, uh, 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 in Little Rock. Like the fictional char character Forrest Gump in the 1994 film by the same name, Lucille witnessed spectacular and inspiring moments in American history. Um, in 1893, she witnessed the hard efforts of Colorado's black and white suffragists payoff as the women of Colorado received the right to vote 20 years before the national women's suffrage. And in Denver a year later, she witnessed black suffragette Elizabeth Piper Ensley rallying black women to the polls. In 1924, she was an avid baseball fan. Uh -huh. So in 1924, she was in the perfect place when the, need, when the first World Series for the Negro League came about in Kansas City, where she was. Uh, so she attended that first game of the National Negro Leagues where the Kansas City Monarchs and the Eastern Colored League champions, the Hillsdale Daily of Derby, Pennsylvania played. She was fluent in German, a language she formally began studying in 1905 at UNC. Okay, and would continue it here. Uh, she also read Latin. In the 1920s, while teaching at the all-black Lincoln High School in Kansas City, Missouri, 
She created the school's first newspaper, The Observer, as well as the World Affairs Club. She wanted her students to learn internationalization and global issues before it became chic. A complex woman, Lucille maintained a long distance courtship for seven years with a man she would eventually marry, John Dota Jones. Happened to be the first Phi Beta Kappa in the United States and happened to be a graduate uh, of my alma mater, Columbia University, and also somebody who founded, helped founded a branch of uh, one of the black fraternities in New York City. Um, but they maintained this long distance relationship for seven years. And then after enduring emotional abuse and abandonment, divorced him in 1940 and never looked back. Just as a tree without roots is dead, a people without history and culture becomes a dead people, Malcolm X. If historians of the American West and of the African American experience have ignored the contributions of Western blacks, they have been especially negligent in chronicling the presence of black women on the Western frontier, Glenda Riley. My research began with the wisdom and guidance of the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson, who said, those who have no records of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration which comes from the teaching of biography and history. Drawing in on personal experiences, I reflected on my own story and, in, and who influenced my, my own personhood. My forebears, strong black and Latina women who never feared telling their story or articulating their voice in spite of the personal or political consequences they faced. Thus, I came into this research from a black a feminist perspective using self-reflexivity, which is characterized by the willingness of the researcher to learn about oneself, me, as I do the research. What is it I'm learning about me as I learned about Lucille? And how did I feel when she was the first and I was the first? And what does the first mean? And why are we still talking about the first? Why is the associate dean for the College of Arts and Sciences the first black woman to hold that honor who was up here a moment ago with you? Why? So I have this thing now about the first, wanting to correct history, but also recognizing how painful that is and how much we have yet to grow as a nation. Okay. Um, Self, uh, so I talk about self-reflexivity and how it is characterized and the relationship with the social world. Consequently, I supplemented the results of, and observations conducted in the field by visiting the big house and walking through the grounds of plantations where Lucille parents were enslaved and toiled, visiting homes where she lived and the schools where she taught if they were still around conducting interviews across race, class, and gender lines, examining her personal accessories, and even visiting the home of Lucille's last two living relatives soon after they committed suicide. There were four suicides in her family, and the last happened when I was at home one night, and I got a call, and you will love this, this is the Las Vegas Police Department calling for Polly McLean. And you know black people, police calling, uh, you have the wrong number. <laughs> uh, sorry. And especially before I did that, I asked, what's your name, woman? And she said, Brenda. I went, police don't say Brenda. They say, detective so-and-so, officer so-and-so. Brenda does not compute. And what did I do? I thought everything you do in Las Vegas stayed in Las Vegas. <laughs> what did I do in Las Vegas that didn't stay there? I got very nervous. So I hung up. I did go on and checked on the uh, 
you know, the machines that we have at our disposal today and found it was a police number. I went, okay. So the next morning I called and I said, my name is so-and-so and I got this bizarre call. Can you tell me about Las Vegas and what's happening? They said, well, there are two women who did a double suicide and your number was the only number available. And those were Lucille's great nieces. Uh, so at that moment, I had to stop. They, they told me I could come to the house where the suicide occurred. Uh, the police was open, the public administrator there, unlike Denver and probably Boulder, and this is something you all need to check, is not an elected position, but appointed by your fellow colleagues and friends who are part of the legal profession. And he, in Las Vegas, is elected. So it was a whole different ball game when I called him back. And he said, you can come and visit. And I went, really? I got to this house, and the only thing they had done was to move the bodies. The helium tanks were still there. The book, the final exit, was still open on the spot where they used to kill themselves. The music was still playing. And I walked into this situation with a cop who said, I'll be around, but you can just look around, do whatever, you got four hours. And after that four hours, I couldn't write for several years. It was a most uh, amazing and personal. So we talk about the personal impact research has on us as people. This had a great personal impact on me. Um, and one of the things that, in the research, there were other things that happened that, again, made me stop. I decided that I wanted to go and walk through the neighborhood uh, where she lived and found on Google that the house was still standing in Kansas City. So, what did I do? I booked a flight. She took. 13 and a half hours by train to get down there, and I did it in a couple hours, or one, maybe an hour and a half. Got to Kansas City, did my archival research, and on Saturday morning decided to call a cab company to say, I want to go to this address. I want to walk this neighborhood. I want to walk in her pathway. I want to see what she saw. I want to feel what she felt. Uh, so an Albanian cab driver showed up and said, lady, uh, you call for a cab? Yes, uh, okay, get in. So I got in, gave him the address, and he kind of paused. And I sort of went, ah, oh, you know, seven in the morning, that may be why he still didn't get his, all his coffee, you know, so what, whatever. So we got in, and he's driving through this neighborhood, which, which was hit by the depression we occurred in here in the early, in the, in, you know, at a certain period of time when we had all this collapse of the economy going on. I mean, this is where I am. And buildings are boarded up. It's just a mess. And we're driving and he's trying to find this address. He didn't have any uh, you know, GPS on any of that. Um, and I had left my camera here and I had to go to Walgreens and buy a uh, disposable. So I'm in the back seat, windows are closed, and I'm snapping pictures of this neighborhood. A red pickup truck drove by, speeding, and turned around and blocked us from moving. And I went, holy shit, what did we do? And at that moment, I said, okay, you have your ID card from Colorado. The guy came out of the truck, very strong, powerful black man and says, where are you going and what are you doing taking pictures in my neighborhood? I went, oops. I then reached into my wallet, pulled out my faculty ID, jumped out of the back seat, and said, here I am, this is who I am, and I'm trying to find the home of Lucille Bluford. And he says, oh, and I told him about Lucille Buchanan. And he said, follow me. So here we have, in an unusual situation, because he takes us to the house, beckons us to come out, stands in the middle of the street at seven in the morning, and he's giving me a history lesson, a community historian, 
with no BA degrees, no college education to his name, it's a high school, and he's in his 50s, and he's giving me a lesson about that house. And that house became the most important house, because when I said she started a school newspaper, one of the students on that school newspaper was Lucille Bluford. And Lucille Bluford, okay, did her BA, started first time a journalist was through Lucille Buchanan. <coughs> and Lucille Bluford would go on to become a renowned journalist in the state of Missouri. But there was a little problem that occurred along the way. And that is after she finished her BA and went to decide to do her master's degree, uh, the journalism department at the University of Missouri shut down to prevent her from attending. And she took them to court. Now, one of the things that I did mention is that Lucille lived in the home of Lucille Bluford when she was a little kid. And when she taught her, that's where she lived for the years. She was about five, six years in Kansas City. So she had left an imprint on this young person's life. And she would go on to become a renowned journalist. Uh, they have a library named after her now, and they keep trying to redo the house. So that's the kind of stuff that happened in the research. There's one other story that happened, and this was the first time I went out in the field. And I hope nobody here is taking any notes to report me to the police department. Um, and this happened in Las Vegas. We found out that Lucille had relatives who did go further west. And I wanted to go to the house where I had that they lived, knowing they weren't alive, and I wanted to feel that house, see what that neighborhood was like. So I took one of my research doctoral students with me, a person who had great interests and had lived in Los Angeles and knew the town quite well. So we showed up about 8 o'clock uh, at this corner lot and house and walked around, and then this uh, doc student, who now is no longer a student, walks up the stairs to a window that looked open, although, you know, and she ran back down and meet him and said, don't go up there. I said, what's wrong? She said, there's a raven in a cage, and the whole place is full with furniture, and there's something bizarre going on. I said, okay, she knows I have a bird phobia. So I, I, I said, okay. Then she comes down, she says, we have to check this out. And I said, but what do we need? How do we check this out? So guess what this researcher says we did? I thought I'd train them better. She opened the people's mailbox and took out the mail. And I said, that's a police crime. You can't do that. She says, no, it's only if I open it. I said, wait a minute. So at that point, and this happens in the black community, somebody across the street is watching. <laughs> this man comes over to us and says, hello, what you doing here? <laughs> yeah, he has to do the description of the story. And he said, well, you know what? Around the corner, there's a guy who knew this family that lived there. Uh, why don't you go and talk to him? Well, we walked around the corner, and I remember, 8 in the morning, he's sitting outside with a six-pack um, with his first open. And that's eight in the morning. And he sat back and he told us all he knew about this family, et cetera. So these are some of the stories that happened along the, the, the trip. Um, so uh, the, going through the 10 states, I went to uh, Alabama, Arkansas, California, Illinois, Missouri, Nevada, New York, uh, North Carolina, Texas, and Virginia in search of Lucille's story. Um, and it was, you know, at times quite difficult, and at times it wasn't. Um, the material was left there, and I was able to kind of uh, go through it. Um, but one of the things I wanted to start off, uh, say to you tonight, is that let's think about today, April 4th, and we're looking at 100 years ago. What was happening at that night? And when we think about that night, it's the war, World War I is going on. The campus is uh, a miraculously in gear for the war. The women are knitting, have been knitting for at least two years, socks and various um, 
uh, things to send to the men. Uh, soldiers were leaving, faculty were leaving to go to do things for the war. Staff were leaving to do the same. Um, but I wanted to look at what was happening if you wanted to do something exciting that night, or if you wanted, if you happened to read the Daily Camera, and what was happening that night. So, uh, Boulder Daily Camera. Kaiser's friends in Boulder are working every day. Um, and that meant that, that the attention and what was happening to our largest immigrant population, the Germans, were being slapped upside down, in and out. And apparently, Temple Baking Company was with sell you some victory bread. You were here in Boulder, and the Boulder Flour Mills ran some some pro troops uh, uh, information. Boost the bonds, that buy the bombs to bust the peace to Berlin. Berlin. We'll put the Kaiser on the run and add the letter G to Hun. Now, if you're looking for escape, you could also look to the camera for that here at the ISIS Theater. Uh, you could choose uh, from two special features, or both, I guess. Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was starring in Out West, and Roy Stewart was uh, starring in Faith in Durin. But I would pass all of that, personally, to go check out Julian L. Ting, -Ting uh, because he was the world's greatest female impersonator. And he was here in Boulder that night, two nights. The Widow's Might. <laughs> um, and this is from uh, the editor of Daily Camera. I'm just read you. Do you realize that Boulder is full of people who are actively engaged in helping the Kaiser? Who are these people, you ask? Not the pacifist. He is usually a born fighter, dwelling, so what, in the clouds. And when, like Henry Ford, reconciles himself to the use of material force, becomes a most relentless fighter. And uh, this is from the Hiskey Grocery and Coffee Co. A roast to the Kaiser. Here's the Kaiser, Kaiser, the Limburger cheese. May the swell in his head go down to his knees. May he break his damn neck on the Hindenburg line and go to hell croaking the watch in the rhyme. <laughs> so, that's where we are. Now, Lucille majored in German uh, because there was a lot of connections, I came to find out. In Loudoun County, Virginia, which just happens to be the richest county in the United States where her uh, paternal family uh, were born and lived, you know, during <coughs> slavery and after uh, when Reconstruction, et cetera. Um, that particular had a number of Germans who were against slavery. And so that was one thing that her parents knew and talked about. She also was raised in a community in Barnum. When her mother oh, showed up here, when the family showed up here in 1882, the first thing that Mother Sarah did was to go and buy a five lots of land from a man named P.T. Barnum. <laughs> P.T. owned a, 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 a town called uh, Barnum Town in De outside of Denver, which eventually would become part of Denver. So that's what happened that night. Um, so they, they did this. Uh, but, you have another one to you? Okay. Um, but I wanted to uh, stop for a minute so I can take you on some of these. Oh, is this going to do something odd? This was the University of Colorado uh, in 1916 when she arrived here on campus. Okay? Um, there were <laughs> uh, three blacks in 1916 out of a student. This is the, not the graduate, this is only undergraduate out of 1,164, one-fourth of 1%. I may have gotten the math wrong. You can fix that later, right, Bob? Uh, <laughs> in the fall of, of, of 2018, we should compare and look and see where we are and what has happened, you know, and how much we've grown. And I'm not going to get into that with you tonight, but I think that is uh, quite challenging. But one of the things that happened is what I call black sightings. Black women on this campus were not in classes. They were the maids of the presidents. 
they were the, the, the cooks and the maids for the fraternity and sorority houses. So that was their contribution. So imagine Lucille, a very dignified, extremely well-dressed, is walking across this campus, and what immediately comes to your mind as to who she is. And therefore, does that lead you to treat her a certain way? How did she overcome some of those things that she was so silent about and never talked about? So that's something to think about. Now, what happened to Lucille, oops, sorry, um, what is it, sorry, um, is that where would she live, okay? So one of the things is that when black students came, oh, by the way, let me go back to the three that was here, which is kind of interesting looking at patterns, um, because I've seen some of those patterns more recently. One of, there were two males and she was a female. One of the males would drop out after his first month and never return. The other one will drop out two, uh, a year before Lucille, you know, about a year and a half after, uh, partly, and then will return and finish in 1921. Uh, those two males, uh, that male would be a major in the College of Engineering. So that's what happened to those three. But what happened when you came here and where are you going to live? Well, white female students didn't have housing on campus. Only the guys did. Okay, so you see what's going on here. And therefore, they had to find housing that was approved by the Dean of Women, who had a list of places, some on the hill, etc., where you can board, live and board. Uh, in Lucille's case, she had the same situation, except she was a non-traditional, because she already had some degrees. Uh, against her name, courses, etc. So one of the things that she did, this is one of the houses she lived in. Uh, and this one uh, is still standing on Mapleton. She lived at 821 Mapleton. Okay. Uh, she also moved from there to this, and this is the Boulder Rado parking lot today. Uh, this house doesn't exist anymore. But what happened is they had choices either lived in what was called a little rectangle where blacks lived, um, or they had to find accommodations elsewhere. And this was stretched to its limit. Um, the little rectangle, you know, was so small um, that it was not often, a space was not uh, often available. So that's what happened with her. She lived in these two places, um, et cetera. Um, now, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about uh, where her family began, because I think that influenced her quite a lot. Um, her parents were, her mother, uh, her father's side actually was born at Oakland's Plantation. I went to Oakland for the first time, and it was quite a puzzling feeling when I was driving up Plantation Lane to this house and how these former um, uh, tourists, uh, these former slave um, plantation places had become uh, a tourist uh, destination. And it sort of made me feel extremely uncomfortable as I did this drive. And what happened is, while I did this drive, and I could understand Lucille's at this campus, is that I walked in and no one would speak to me. I went to buy, it. everywhere I went, there was a distancing of, oh my gosh, she's a black person here, and she's looking at a plantation, and you know what that means, uh, et cetera, and this is not cool at all. Uh, uh, so that had been my experience here. Um, and, uh, oops, that picture on the side happens to be Lucille's grandfather, Fenton Buchanan, uh, who, uh, were you know enslaved there, etc. And it's quite interesting this particular plantation um, scene. Ah, uh, oops, he shouldn't be there. When I talked about the fact that Lucille um, was the reverse, was the reversal driving Miss Daisy. She had a white driver. That's him. A cool dude, isn't it? She knew how to pick men. <laughs> but this was not a relationship that you're thinking. I know where your minds are. This is very simple. He was a friend of her brother. When the brother died, Lucille is left alone in the house. 
that the father built for the family that is still standing right away in Denver, Colorado. And therefore she hired him to take care of taking her shopping, uh, to go buy groceries when she couldn't go, take her to the bank, take her to her lawyer, take her to do all the things, and particularly to vote. Um, so that was his job, and two of his uh, children are in the audience today. Just want to let you know that. So this is Herman Dick, uh, a German born in Russia. There's the connection because they spoke German together. And again, this connection is quite amazing. Uh, this is the tombstone, and not to give much away, but this is a tombstone that she built when 1953 when she went you know, and bought the plot and bought this. This would be destroyed just before she died. And therefore, they sold her plot. Uh, and uh, that was it. Um, here she is with the senior class. There she is. Because when I first saw this picture, um, they said to me, uh, well, our first black graduate was in 1911. I said, no, I think you're a little wrong. And they said, well, we have a picture of the class, and there's no black people in there. I said, okay, bring it. Let's blow it up. <laughs> and at that moment, I said, you see this face? Black. <laughs> and there she is. <laughs> so, um, I also went to Evergreen Plantation. And this one was quite amazing in that that's the plantation home. It didn't look like that when I went there. That is Edmund Berkeley, and that is her mother, Sarah Bishop. Anybody could figure out anything here? Huh? That's daddy. So Lucille's grandfather on her mother's side was a slave owner. And I must say, there were times that I had, um, I had often run into, in Virginia, um, and I love going to Virginia because the passionate, the behavior I see there in terms of trying to correct or trying to analyze or rethink history, especially in the slave period, is significant, all right? And what happened is, I went to Virginia, and I'm in a library standing in Loudoun County, and I'm talking to uh, somebody that was, I was told, this is a descendant of Edmund. I said, hi, how are you doing? I am so-and-so, and I got something very hard to tell you, that I have a letter that Sarah wrote to, I believe, her father, Edmund Berkeley. Sarah wrote a letter that is the most amazing letter, one I've never seen a slave wrote in all of my work on, on not just this but before this, to her father, uh, telling him how difficult life is for her in Denver. It's not like it was when she was back home. Now, at first I thought, okay, she's pulling up a little trick here on him, trying to get, because she says that for money, something that you normally wouldn't do. Uh, and then says, you know, how about, you know, you know, looking at his daughter. Well, it turns out that not only she's asking this, but she names Lucille, was not her real name. She was named Lucy after her white half-sister. That's who Lucille was named. And Lucille, Lucille changed her name from Lucy to Lucille. So this became, so I'm writing there and I'm speaking to this woman and she says, oh no, not at, not, not at all, this is absolutely incorrect. A white male is standing there and says, now come, come techie. You know how they used to, miscegenation used to go on and they used to go with black women all the time. And she sought her position. Next thing you know, I'm being invited to her house. Which when I got to that house, I went back into some error that I had never went back to. <laughs> uh, it was as if I was now in 1860 in Virginia, based upon what memorabilia she left behind, she had in there. The smell, the carpeting, the whole thing was amazing. And eventually, Techie would become a friend. 
she turned, she turned around and even started sending me things before she passed. Um, so that would happen. Now, eventually, I would end up finding Edmund's great, great, great granddaughter. And one night, someone planned a meeting with me and her. And this time, I said, I'm coming prepared. So I brought 10 pieces of information to prove what I was going to prove to her. It was amazing. We had it on the plantation, coffee and tea on the plantation, which is now a golf course. But the manor house is still standing. And here I am on the veranda at 8 o'clock at night having tea. And then I thought of how much I was reliving Martin Luther King's dream when he said, form a slaveholders and we'll sit together in brotherhood and friendship. And I thought at that moment I was Lucille standing. It was an amazing discovery and that I made that night uh, with this great, great grand uh, daughter. Um, so very quickly, Loudoun County, uh, where all, these are the Buchanans, by the way, who came from Virginia to Colorado. And in their coming here, uh, and James would be Lucille's uh, uh, father, okay? Uh, in their coming here, the folks in Virginia never knew, or they had tied out so much that there was a branch left in Colorado. So I was in this research, was able to find Lucille's great, great uncle side that is 14 generations now removed, but I uh, found them as the Buchanans in this research that I've been doing. Um, Denver in the early 1880s, this is where they lived, uh, downtown. And this is, you know, there was always problems flooding, and that flooding, and the railroads, and the smell, and you know, the pollution of the water, all of this caused them to move many times before they will eventually settled here by, from this man that they bought uh, five lots of land in Barnum Town, which was in Corbin, 1880-something. Um, Laura and Fenton, this is the first picture of Lucille as a baby. And her brother is there, Fenton Buchanan, who would become, he would move, be, he was a teamster. So he moved from doing horses to driving trucks over the course of his life. And, uh, the one thing is that picture is the only one that, that's been left of, of her sister Laura, who would have been the first to graduate from UNC, who committed suicide um, before uh, finishing. Um, this is the house on Raleigh Street that her father built, a mini Queen Anne, uh, which was very popular at that moment in time historically. I book talk about all of this, so it's, it's there. What happened to quite disturbing to me is the fact that I wasn't fast enough or good enough to spend the time, and it was difficult, to get the, the city to landmark that. While the outside stayed the same, what happened is somebody flipped it and tore up everything inside, which was totally Victorian. I'd never seen anything like this before, um, and therefore sold it. Um, and there were remnants left where I kept saying, can this go to a museum? This is one of the wheels from the uh, horses that they drove that was left there. Um, Mrs. Vaughn's <laughs> class at Villa Park School. Um, there's one little black female in the group there. Um, Villa Park School, this is where Lucille graduated from. Uh, in, uh, and, uh, and then, this is her at her commencement exercise in 1901. And she will go to UNC in 1903 and will eventually come here later on. Um, and these are some pictures of her. This picture on the right side happens to have been taken when she was a student here. There are very few I have of that. But one of the things, and there she is feeding the chickens, <laughs> and uh, the reason how I know the time period is because I know when that baby was born. So that led me to say, oh, what's happening in this period? Lucy, yeah. This is the family that's on that porch. And 
Um, only one is missing, but these are the sisters, and that's Fenton in the back, and the youngest, Clarabelle, is there. Now, there's something about Clarabelle that I think might fascinate you, that I discovered. You're going to love this one. Yeah. Clarabelle uh, was 13 years old. This was an article in the newspaper. Clarabelle is 13 years old, and she, uh, now remember, they're living in an all-white community with immigrants largely, or whites that were not immigrants but came from the north. So there weren't any southerners necessarily living near them. And they built bridges with the immigrant community and the white community. The fact that he was elected against a white, a, a black, a white man ran the street commissioner against this black guy. He made, he made it. Uh, so you see what was happening here at this moment in time. So uh, Clarabelle, at 13 years old, uh, everybody was out of the house, she was by herself there. And got herself, a man came in, white man, didn't think he was coming into a black home, because it's a white neighborhood, right? And it's a ritzy house. And held a gun at her, and told her to put her hands up. So she does. And then, she thought, because that's what the article tells me, for a moment, they interviewed her. And she raised up her leg and kicks the gun out of his hand. True Western style. <laughs> this is the West all over. Kicks the gun, it falls on the ground. She picks it up, 13 years old, puts it at him and say, walk. <laughs> she walked him up two blocks to where there was a phone to call the police to get him arrested. And they put his name in there, and I can't wait to track that one down. <laughs> so, and the article goes on to say how athletic she was, <laughs> and that the, she's admired by the students in Colorado. <laughs> so I thought that was a fascinating one, very quickly. Uh, one of the things that blacks did, and especially the fact we are now, a lot of, the, the book is actually about the rise of the black middle class, okay? And there are very few books written on the black middle class in the West. And this one is to show you what they did for leisure. There they are, going up to Pike's Peak for two sisters on you. Okay? Um, they also see this is Mother and Clarabelle at the Festival of Mountain and Plains in 1912. Mother Sarah and Sister Clarabelle. Okay? So they did things. Um, uh, here they are, the Garden of the Gods. Uh, some of you have been there, right? You take your picture there. There they are. <laughs> Blacks. And you know, niece is in there, that picture. Um, and this is Cranford Hall, the State Teachers College, uh, in 1903, where in UNC. So it's always one building that started. This was the building that everything was in. Um, and there, of course, she, I showed you her earlier on. Uh, a little rock school is where she went, and the newspaper did an article. There it is. Miss Lucille Buchanan, who graduated from the State Normal College with the teacher of uh, literature, was appointed to the Arkansas Baptist College of Little Rock, and that's because they would not hire her. They would not give her a job. So she ended up going down south. And that was not unusual because she was following Du Bois' model. Uplift the race. Teach, and that will, will do it. You know, she was against, you know, she went, uh, he was against the Booker T. Go out and do technical work, go to technical colleges. Didn't we hear that now? Vocational training? Mm -hmm. And we keep hearing this a lot now. Well, not plus on change, on plus on la même chose. So that's what happened there. Um, this is where she taught uh, at Langston High School in Hot Springs. Um, and what happened is she left Hot Springs. She was adored. I have a letter that was written by the principal that praises Lucille's teaching, her intellect, saying if you don't come back, we do not know what to do. He sent it to Denver, sent it first class, put two cents <coughs> on it, not just one, and just begged her she would go back. But he begged her and outlined how much her life did not, you know, how much she did. So this is what happens, uh, you know, in that CU at the time. Kathy became the favorite color on campus um, because everybody had to uplift to the, and Mackey Auditorium is where. 
So I want to stop now because there's, I've written, this book is 17 chapters long. Uh, I thought I could only write three or four. It didn't work out that way. Uh, and there's so much more to talk about, but I thought maybe you have some questions that I might be able to answer. Anybody? No, she, yes. You know, what happened is, um, this was the College of Liberal Arts, the whole building. And all the departments and the classrooms were in here. And they came once, the class, the university sent students to this room once a week for uh, best of services, okay? So they came in here, sitting in these seats <coughs> that you're in. Um, and what happened is, so she went to classes here. All of her classes were held here. Did she have any contact with Mary Rippon, though? Mary Rippon? No, I cannot find anything. Uh, and part of what it is, and I do argue this, is that the students that they were interested in were the young students coming in. Um, and they met them at the uh, Boulder Depot. They had a, a, a committee to bring these, you know, 16 and 17 year olds here. So they did, and most of the interest was around that. The women's building was here when she was here. Uh, the dean of women had events that you would assume Lucille would be part of. I've looked through her archives, I've talked, nothing mentions Lucille. It's as if, but the, but the Daily Camera did put, there are two, there are two things that you must, uh, know. first they put in the Daily Camera, um, her name shows up when, you know, uh, at graduation, you know, because this is the university that sent everybody's names over there. The other thing that's important to recognize is that we didn't keep ethnicity or race, whatever you want to call it, uh, back then. And one of the research strategies that I've used is the black press. So I went to the black press, and every so, every so often, it, well, let me back up. The black press in Denver had a, a week, once a week, weekly, a column that's called Boulder Notes. And therefore, it reported what was going on in the little rectangle. And who's doing what, where you're going, etc. And it'll often say things like, uh, John Smith is now with the university. I will then go look up John Smith and see, oh, he's black, he's with the university. They kept up and told you the ethnicity. And that's how I was able to find uh, the ethnicities of many of these folks. The first black that I've been able to track uh, down was graduating in 1912 and became a chemist, um, you know, and amazing history and life um, graduated out of the College of Engineering. Uh, but that's, that's kind of what it is. Any other questions? Why do you think uh, it has taken so long to honor her graduation from CU? Thank you. Thank you. That's a tough one. I could tell you what, you know, uh, my heart may say, you know, but I, I try to figure out where's the research here. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, is that the university had already designated the first, and so did the city of Denver. I mean, city of Boulder. So when you come along, you're going to be upsetting what has been the history for 30 something years. And I think that may be one of the things that kept it very much not paying attention like one should pay attention. Gee, this is interesting. And the fact, and I do not have this in the book, so you don't look for it if you ever get it. Um, in, and there is a, uh, one, there's a couple here, and a particular woman by the name of Doris Smith, who was an angel because she became the, the face that Lucille saw uh, at a, when she was taken out of her house when she was 103 and put into a black nursing home. And it was that couple who bought the house, particularly the woman, who came to her 
rescue and would talk with her. So when they did the case in point, when they said to her, you, you, you know, she's 103, right? You can't have any salt. We're not put you on a salt-free diet. 103. Uh, Doris says, uh, and it's in the book. Doris goes, uh-uh, 103? Give her all the salt she wants. And, and she snuck in salt shakers. She's here. Hi, Doris. Sorry. I do out you in the book. So, and then the other thing is black women who start losing their hair. And I have to get some, you know, remind me to buy a bottle. Olive oil. That's the trick. Maybe anybody wants to know, use olive oil. Uh, so the olive oil, she was very conscious that she was losing her beautiful hair. So what did she do? She asked for it. They won't give her. So who sneaks it in? Doris. <laughs> so, you know, when you have named your first, it's the same as when I went to UNC and I said, your first is in 1911? You know, it's about 1905 with all this evidence that I presented. And I went, oh, you know, you're right. Uh, so that becomes part of it. Some of it, I would say, there is one now that I've thought about of, of a person that's been designated the first person to get uh, to be a teacher in Denver, black. And this person now is in their 90s. And I, if you ever get to read the book, you find that I found people teaching way back in through the first male was in the 1870s. Life. Uh, so, do I want to upset her at that age? No. She will pass. Maybe even I will go before her. But she will pass. And I think it's not in my best interest or her interest to change that. So, it's that, that piece I feel. But, as I said, you know, when you have designated, there are other things that it becomes more important. Then, and I'm really a, a, kick, a stickler for, let's get the history straight first, because we're going to keep passing this on, and let's, let's work this out. So that may be one of the things uh, I have not asked, <laughs> you know, because the people to ask are no longer here, okay, and they never wrote anything, you know. But I found the evidence. I mean, she's listed in the 1917 uh, student directory here. She was here. <laughs> I have her graduation certificate. She was here. <laughs> you know, I have her, her course grade. She was here. So that's part of it. It's very hard to do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. When does the book come out? Uh, are are there any people here from the press? Do we know? <laughs> May is what I just thought, but I don't know. We think June. We think June. Be available. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to have a book signing event? Uh, are we going to have? Yes. Patty says yes, I do whatever she says. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you find out about that? Yeah, they'll get out. The Center for the American West will get out because it's a Western story. Uh, what I've done with it is that I weaved in the history of black. So it's very much tied in with black history everywhere she went. So when we, I talked about, uh, I'm going to out something here today that uh, some of my uh, former students are here flew in for this. For example, uh, we talked about Lucille's husband, right? Gorgeous man. Drop dead gorgeous. Well, it took me so many years to figure out that their marriage, and I'm going to say it, and you promise not to tell anyone, right? <laughs> was a broke back marriage. <laughs> a broke back marriage. And I'm not going to tell you what that is, you better get it for. <laughs> and that, that led me to understand something I never knew about Chicago. How open they were at a particular period in time of, of having uh, gays in the community. Amazing what some people have unearthed and which I was privy to understand. Something I would never have expected in, 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 a, in Chicago, especially in the black area. Uh, so, it, you know, with, with clubs and this and that and gay communities, etc. shocked me. So, that's part of it. Anything else? Yes. So what did she do when she wasn't allowed to walk? It's just so what happened was, and I got this, this is oral. I interviewed her niece, her niece, not the great nieces who come in, so her niece before she died. And that, that interview kept going on and back with letters, 
that she would write me. So what happened is, Denise says, Aunt Lucy was very upset with seeing you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what happened? <laughs> she said, well, a white female, she's sitting waiting to be called, a white female came up to her and said, hi Lucy, I'll, uh, here's your diploma, I'll be your stand-in. <laughs> and I read that, that's what she said? She said yes, and, and then she goes on to say, which I don't write in, <laughs> uh, Lucy was uh, very upset and um, uh, had decided she would never have anything to do with see you again, um, and she never did. Uh, she would be back here for 40 something years and um, before. And getting back to part of your question too, uh, I did interview somebody who said, uh, and that person might be in this audience today, who said, when I found out about this, uh, being the first, and when I you know, uh, decided one day to call the university and say, guess what? You got this person. Could you, somebody come? And you know, here it is, the information. Nobody showed up, nobody made any changes. So that's kind of what happened. So yeah, that would be how it went down. So she does have, she did have a diploma. Because what happened when she left here, I have found in the memorabilia left behind, her mother had just, her father was killed by the fire department, ringing that bells in the newfangled new cars that they were driving, and he is creeping along up federal with his uh, horse and buggy, and the spook, the, the fire bell people was annoyed that he was going so slow, so they started ringing, the horses got spooked, he gets pelt up in the air, dropped on the ground on Federal Boulevard, and will eventually uh, die. Uh, and that's very close to when Lucia was here. She was here when that went on. Uh, and the mother, the mother came here in <coughs> full mourning, head to toe mourning gear. Um, two sisters showed up and one of the nieces. Uh, and the picture is at their house in Denver, that house you saw, uh, not here on campus. Any other questions? Um, yes. Um, I'm sorry, a little bit hard of hearing, so you may have already addressed this, but I just couldn't hear you. But when she went to UNC, yeah. uh, did you say she had a, a two-year degree? Yes. And, and was there a graduation ceremony? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And, I, and it was in the thing and everything. In addition, you know, it was a dry, I don't know if you know, it was a dry town. Really. Uh, but also, it was found, she lived with a family that were abolitionists. So they she had a had very a different job. experience than her sister, who went to Greeley and who committed suicide before the, and didn't even enroll for the first semester. But Lucille had, and the person who uh, Lucille lived with and his family paid, what, 20 bucks to Bill Cran for the hall. And, and so she was in an environment there that was far different than the environment her sister was in uh, when she uh, decided that life was too much. And her, 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 uh, the sister who committed suicide in the front page of the, den of the local newspapers. They carried it for two days because it took, after shooting herself in the chest at home with the daddy's gun, it took two days for her to die. And I did not say what I think happened, but I put enough information for people to figure out what happened based upon the demographics of the house she was living in. Because students, just like here, had to find homes to take you in. They could not live on campus, same thing there. So you had to go in the community and find a home to live. Lucy was very lucky where she ended up, with very, very prominent uh, citizens of Korea. Yeah, any other questions? There's one right here. Oh, I can't see. Go. Uh, what year was it when her last two relatives committed suicide? 2010. And how old were they? 58 and 59. Are yes. Did she, walk, did she walk in graduation at Greeley? Uh, she was there, and the mother went up for it, too. And it made the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. It didn't have the list, but 
it, you know, did black newspaper cover this? <laughs> it didn't stop her the way It didn't stop her, no. And I have a copy of the program that she left behind. <laughs> yes. Dr. McLean, um, did Lucille have a relationship with Colonel Edmund Berkeley? Did she know about him in the Battle of the War? Yeah, I believe she did. <clears throat> yes, she did. The family knew. Because what happened in the end, I started looking at them, uh, uh, their death certificates. I started looking at their marriage certificates. I started looking at all the available data that was left behind to be able to put the pieces together. And several of her sisters started listing Edmund Berkeley as the father <laughs> of her mother. And I believe by giving Lucy, see, what really triggered me on this is besides the article that this guy wrote, but I went, her name was Lucy, put that, that Berkeley, you can't, why would anybody get Berkeley in 1880? Mm. Where did Berkeley come from? And then I started putting the pieces together and realized Edmund Berkeley. She could not use Berkeley when she was in Virginia, even after slavery ended. But she chose to, to acknowledge the white side of her family by putting it on Lucy, the firstborn in Colorado in the West. And that's what I believe she did, the mother did. And in addition, I was also interviewed by someone who knew Lucille before she passed, who said she often said that my grand, that Edmund gave my mama the money to come out here to buy the plot, because it cost $100, a lot of money back then, to buy the land, because soon she showed up. And the one thing that Colorado has had going for itself is that it had a, 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 a law that allowed women to claim to be the rightful owner. It wasn't like the guy got everything. Women were able to claim. So that plot that she bought stayed under the mother's name until about 19, remember we're talking about 1882. It was stay under the mother's name until about 1960 um, something when Lucille decided, okay, it's time to fix this. Mama is dead, half the rest of the sisters are dead. Those that are alive, let's give that house to everybody a piece, a piece, a piece. So that's what happened. Yeah. Hmm. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah. Go. So, what do you hope um, young or undergraduate, specifically African American students, can take from this work? Yeah, I think that's it. The stick to it, Miss. Don't, don't allow. I mean, what happened to you? I get, I mean, I have lived in many African countries. I, you know, 40 or whatever. <laughs> uh, the only place I've ever been called a nigger was on the corner of Broadway and University, twice, in Boulder, Colorado. And one, my white doc student was with me and he goes, oh my God, what, what did we do? I said, nothing. And the other time, it, somebody came up to my face. It was snowing. And I was like, um, don't move because you don't know what weapons he may have. Just, but don't let that stop you. You know, that's, that's, that's a major lesson. And that's what she would not have done. She walked with her head high, even though they may have thought she was the maid. So I think that there is a lesson here. I mean, the fact that we consistently suffer with microaggressions, it happens to me all the time, no matter what. Nobody wants me to write on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it happens, and it particularly happens <coughs> to black women on this campus. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>